Well, Toto, welcome back to Australia. I think officially Formula One fever has hit Melbourne like we've never seen before. You've been part of this game for a very long time. Did you ever think when you first began in Formula One that the circus could be as prolific as it is today? Uh, no, it's huge. Um, I remember being here for the first time in 2013, just starting in my role, and it was already a super vibe. But this, no, it's... I said uh, yesterday I've been on the fan zone on the, on stage there, and I think it was 10,000 people. Uh, you feel like uh, Elton John in front of his crowd, so it was an amazing experience. 24 races this year. Has Formula One peaked, or can the show get bigger? I think... Um, we always need to improve and uh, we need a good product, we need exciting racing and uh, personalities and a good program around and the event overall is very well organized here so uh, you can always get better. Give us the debrief after qualifying. Debrief is that you know, we've introduced new regulations two years ago where they're not so new anymore and we are struggling. We've won eight times in a row but you can't count on that. It's, uh, it's been more difficult years and uh, Red Bull is, is very much at the top, and then it's a gang of Ferrari, McLaren, and maybe ourselves. Um, but today was a difficult day. Seven and 11s is clearly not where we're setting our expectations, but at the same time, you need to be humble. You know, they're formidable teams. They're doing great work, and um, we haven't done that. What has George said after qualifying? George said that we're having a... Uh, we're having a gremlin in that car somewhere that allows us to be really fast in some sessions and on some days. But then uh, overall, it's just an unstable platform. You know, you're driving it it's, and it's not giving you confidence. Is that conducive with the feedback that he gave after the first two rounds or is this a car still revealing itself? It's a little bit the same since two years. Um, I think this one is the, the, the best of the, of the, of the bed. Uh, so it's a better platform to work on, but it's still not um, a car that a driver feels really good about throwing in the corner at uh, 200 miles an hour. And Lewis, what was the feedback from him? Uh, well, Lewis was out in, uh, in being, being 11th and he said he just didn't feel the grip that he felt in the, in the uh, FP3, the best practice session right before, where he was within the tents to, to, the, to Leclerc it was, or Sainz, the leader performance, the pace was gone. So what are the ideas for tomorrow? I'm sure you've been uh, back talking to HQ and the Brains Trust that you have working in Brackley. What do you think you could achieve in the Grand Prix? Uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it with a very long-term perspective. Uh, I'm part of the team uh, as a, as a co-shareholder co and I think I want to look back in 10 years and 20 years and say there's been many more championships that we won, but you need to be realistic about what you can achieve in a single weekend. We we're not where we want to be. We just got to, you know, dig deep, put our head down and continue to work and, and add performance and eventually, um, you know, be more competitive. But it's, I, I doubt it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> you know how to harness the beast in Lewis. And I don't know that we've seen him quite as despondent as we did when he got out of the car on Friday. He said it's the least confidence he's had in his car for quite some time. How do you pick him up when he's in that mindset? I think you should have heard him after FP3 this morning. He said that the car is the best in three years. <laughs> he had so much rear down for us and he feels confident. Uh, and we didn't change the car a lot. We, uh, track temperature changed by five degrees, believe it or not. So that's nothing. And the car transformed from something that was the best in three years to something that is undrivable. So how do you explain that? Well, we have no idea. <laughs> We're looking and at the... Is that part of the issue though? That's part of the issue. We're having... Uh, two and a half thousand people that work on, on these cars, the half on the engine, the other half on the, on the chassis, and we are, we are looking at everything. And there's something which our technology is not showing us because this um, window of performance is so narrow. Um, where the arrow works or, uh, or it doesn't, uh, no, lots of wind. The wind picked up in the afternoon. D that plays a role, but we haven't really been able to pinpoint it. You had said on Friday that you were experimenting with some things in the car. Is that something we're likely to see throughout the season on Fridays, particularly for Lewis? I think we, we are coming to a point now that we probably need to experiment every single race, not, not only on Friday, because our performance seems to um, you know, get worse throughout the weekend. Uh, we're good on Friday, then we are good in some of the sessions on Saturday, but the more grip we have, the faster it goes, the more we reach the ceiling of the performance ceiling of the car. And, uh, it, our data show us it's not the ceiling. 
Hindsight's always a beautiful thing. When you think back over how the championship has transpired over the last couple of years, what do you feel like has been the turning point where you maybe have lost your way? Can you pinpoint that? I think we've lost our way at the beginning of 22 um, because all our tools and systems gave us cars that were winning championships every single year. And then the new regulations were very much around the ground effect. That means all the suction happens through the floor. And, and, and we came out with a car that showed all the promises in the, on the data and in the wind tunnel, but we didn't deliver. And then since then, we've changed everything from the layout, the suspension, the driver's position, the gearboxes. Uh, but it seems that the fundamental issue is at the core. We haven't solved it. The big story, of course, coming into the season was that Lewis Hamilton would be leaving this team, a team that he's been part of and had great success with for such a long time, to Ferrari. What was the time difference between you finding out that was his decision and then the rest of the world knowing that? Not a lot. Um, I think it was difficult for him to really, uh, to really tell me because he left for the Christmas holiday and was Mercedes forever. And uh, normally that's a time where we, where we don't speak a lot um, because he's gone, because yeah. otherwise we're speaking every day. And then he came back and said, can we have a coffee? He came for the coffee. That's the normal thing we're doing when the season kicks off. And he said, I'm leaving to Ferrari. And I said, really? Um, and not that it shocked me um, because we knew that we have a short term contract, um, but the timing at the beginning of the season. And I said, why at the beginning of the season? He said, he just wanted to have it out and then not have it as a burden emotional burden and then you get, you got to stay pragmatic uh, after a five minute um, um, shock and disbelief it was like okay what are we doing announcement what are we doing going forward into the season and uh, and he said well the announcement is a tricky thing because I think it's leaking <laughs> so it didn't give me lots of options yeah imagine that leaking in Formula One who would ever thought <laughs> in your heart of hearts knowing the personal relationship that you have with him were you disappointed no not at all I think um, sports um, um, sports people have a, a, a let's say a limited um, uh, shelf life when they are at the peak of their performance, uh, peak of their earning power, and that is maybe ten or to fifteen years, and they gotta do it. And they, it's that limited amount of time where you want to win as many races and, and earn as much as possible. And that's why I understand that he says I gotta go a different path. I need to reinvent myself, and I see the positives because. Our years were so great and we, we, we really have a strong bond and in the same way we are able to separate in wishing each other really all, uh, all the best. I hope we, we're beating him on track. Um, and we on the same time can embark in a new route with, a, with, a, with another new driver next to George. You're a competitive beast. What is it going to feel like for you when you see him lining up on the grid for Ferrari next to I, Is it a bit more fire? Uh, I think first I can't imagine him in red. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't think it suits him, um, <laughs> but I think that picture is going to be interesting. Um, and then I told him, you got to really um, uh, picture our rear wing because that's the perspective you're going to have. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Do you think having Max in your car right now would add to performance? No, I just think we, he's extraordinary, but we would give him a car that's a handful. Um, difficult to difficult to set up and drive and I'd rather make that step and you know be out there and say you know this is a car you could drive because it's also going fast. Do you think that you're going to have a decision on that anytime soon? What is the time frame around actually knowing who that person is going to be next to George? The, you know that as much as we were uh, taken aback by Lewis's decision um, so quickly now I want to really take my time uh, we have a slot three, the, the only one in the top teams, uh, unless Max decides he goes, then the slot is not going to be free with us anymore. Um, there is a few options that are really interesting for us, from the very young super talent to some of the elder ones who are very experienced. Uh, and that's not going to happen in the next few weeks or, or a month or so. I want to I wanna continue to monitor the market. So when is it likely that you'll have a decision? Is it something that you do post-season at the end of the year? No, towards the summer. I think towards the summer. Will George's performance this year influence the decision that you make ultimately on the team that he'll have? No, he's he's a he's a bank. Uh, he's having that seat. He's he has been part of our junior program for a long time, and it's a reason why because he's great, and uh, so it's about the second seat. But by that I mean, if George can perform this year, you'll opt for someone that is younger and less experienced to be second to him, or perhaps if it doesn't go his way, do you need to opt for experience? 
Well, I don't know yet. I think it depends also what Max does. Mm, and uh, and then we have, a, we have a young kid that is very promising. I don't want to put more extra pressure on him, but it looks like he's, he can be one of the great ones. But we also don't want to drown in jumping so quickly in an F1 car, 17. So there's a few options that we could, that we could um, uh, play with him. And uh, well, obviously there's Fernando. Uh, it's very exciting, and uh, and Carlos very good. So there's a few a few ones. You had a big decision to make, don't you? Yeah, but this time I'm gonna I'm gonna make the play like the bride difficult to get. Excellent. You had an opportunity to sign Max, I think before he signed Red Bull. How do you look back on that time now? Was he the one that got away? I mean, like I said, hindsight's a beautiful thing. You know a lot uh, <laughs> about about us. Uh, yeah, I've seen him in Formula Three and. Uh, he was very good and um, I have a good relationship to his father. So we sat down in, in my home in Vienna and said, what can we do? And I wasn't able to give him a Formula One seat. Um, I said, let's do F2 together. It was GP2 back in the day. And we fully funded and then I'll guarantee a seat next year um, in the car. And they said, well, we have an offer from, from Red Bull for an Alfa Tauri. Um, basically from now on and, uh, and that was it. I knew that we wouldn't be able to compete with that and uh, half into the season I think he replaced um, another driver in Red Bull and took the seat and here we go, he's a three-time world champion. So there is a little bit, it's a little bit poetic between you two then. If you were able to snatch Max it would sort of come full circle considering what you've been through together. Exactly, so it's a kind of relationship that needs to happen at a certain stage but we don't know when. He's your number one pick? Mm. Uh, y yes, I mean, you see what his performance levels are, but I wouldn't want to discount the other ones too. I think you, we got to look at ourselves and say, what is it we can do with this car? Yeah. And then it becomes much easier, who, whoever drives the second car, it's become a much easier for George because he has the, the potential of being a world champion and uh, so much more our, the team's problem to solve than really looking for a silver bullet with an amazing driver. Well, Toto, I'm wishing you all the best for the Australian Grand Prix. You're not promising anything, but you've you've come from behind much further down the grid, so anything is possible in Formula One. Thanks for joining us on Fox Sports and all the best for the rest of the year. Thank you very much.